Good morning. So great to see everybody here. I want to welcome everyone in the room, trustees, faculty, special guests, alumni, community members, and of course, the wonderful senior class, starting out on the beginning of the end. Welcome. I, w I wasn't here with you at the beginning of your beginning, but I feel really honored to take this final journey with you this year. I come to you today with a message from the people of the future. We are doing everything wrong. We drive cars and use devices and live our lives in ways that pollute the air and the water and the land. We sometimes are unkind to people we love and insensitive to the plight of strangers. We eat food that the people of the future want us to know is completely disgusting. We study the wrong things, we care about the wrong things, and our politics are mess, and our technology is dumb. The people of the future say, it's so obvious. They want to know why we haven't figured it out yet. As a historian, I've spent the better part of my adult life seeking to make sense of the actions of those who came before us. While we owe everything we have to our ancestors, the legacy they've left us with is mixed, and their decision often seem as inscrutable to me as our behavior will to the people of the future. The question of what to do about this is one that looms large for us at Williams and in the world right now. Take my own field of French history. The French government collaborated with the Nazis in their murderous persecution, and French policies towards colonial subjects and post-colonial immigrants were also often shaped by xenophobia and racism. But is it enough to say France bad, minorities and colonial subjects good? Such an approach will not take you very far. While every society tries to be the very best version of itself, people from all backgrounds and all cultures can fall short. The challenge for us as historians, and no matter what you majored in, we are all historians, is to understand why. Why did people make the choices they did? How is it that people who believe themselves to be good, or morally righteous, or just plain right, engaged in actions that so clearly seem compromised to us who came later. Put another way, how is it that the choices we are making right now will look so foolish and obviously wrong to the people of the future? Because they will. And it's a lot easier to judge those who came before than it is to imagine what it will, was like to be them and to understand why they did what they did. And seeking that empath empathic understanding without surrendering our moral and ethical judgment is the hardest job of all. If you look at this fall's programming at Williams, we're going to spend a lot of time asking how we, as the people of someone else's future, want to judge our predecessors. And asking what message we want to send to our own posterity, too. Whether it's looking back at Williams' relationship with Hawaii or the history of efforts to support Asian American studies, or looking to the future and thinking about our work on sustainability or the next era of liberal arts education, whatever it is, what message will we want to send the people of the past or to the people of the future? Actually, we've already been doing a lot of this work at Williams. If you'll recall, Professor Karen Merrill and a committee of faculty, staff, and students spent almost a year and a half studying our campus spaces and institutional history. Their report, which is on the president's website, provides one really valuable framework for thinking about issues of our historical legacy. It says, in part, that we want to, quote, neither erase the past nor immobilize it in amber. But how can we avoid erasure on the one hand and petrification on the other? Put differently, should we be passing moral judgments on the worlds of Genghis Khan or the Incas? I very much believe there is a right and wrong, but I also know humans have reached different conclusions about what that code is at different times and in different circumstances. And yet how could I not judge? 
If we try to think about the Holocaust or the white European and American enslavement of black Africans as things that just happened, we would be propagating an intolerable moral amnesia. Can we judge some historical actors, like slaveholders or Nazis, but not others? And it gets even more complicated, because even if we figure out our message to the past, they're not listening. They're gone. What we have left are the stories that we tell, not to them, but to each other. And the ways we tell these stories to each other say as much about our needs as about the past. Near the end of our Williams Reed's novel, Sing, Unburied Sing, a ghost talks about his efforts to enter the present world. I can't come inside. I tried. There needs to be some need, some lack, like a keyhole. This is what we mean by interpretation. The past communicates with us in the present through the keyhole of our needs and lacks. We don't invite everything in through that keyhole. We can't, because a history that included every last detail of lived reality would be about as useful as a map of Williams that's one-to-one -one scale. Our needs, great as they feel to us, have to have limits, and so do our histories, and that's a challenge. This process of reduction goes on all the time. We can never really know what it was like to live along the Nile 2,000 years ago or on the Great Plains before the arrival of Europeans, or in Paris in the 1920s. And which person, in which arrondissement of Paris, on which day? I'm not even sure I could describe to you what I did this morning. Certainly not in enough detail to give you an accurate sense of what it was like to be me at 8 a.m. And trust me, you don't want to know. But it's an apt comparison, trying to understand what it was like to live in another time is like trying to imagine being a different person. When I think about someone living in Paris in the 1920s, I do so from my viewpoint in Williamstown in 2018. So too, when you try to imagine what it's like to be someone else in the past, or even someone right here next to you right now, you can never really escape your own perspective. We reach, but we never grasp. Living in an educational community like Williams involves a lot of reaching and a lot of never grasping. It's the necessary work of living in an inclusive community, but it's also the work of reading medieval literature or trying to master a chemistry experiment when you're not a chemist or of talking to an interviewer for your first job. It's also the work of looking back at our own history and the choices made by past Williams students, faculty, staff, and graduates. We can't think of this effort in terms of success or failure. It's a process. But there's a real question of where the room should be in that process for observation and for compassion and for judgment. And we will get it wrong. I hope some of you heard Martha Minow when she was here last weekend talking about forgiveness and how it has to complement judgment in societies that are healing. Judgment is crucial diagnostically and forgiveness is part of how we move forward from that diagnosis. It's a very complex balance. As seniors, you're being asked to think about such things which you didn't have to worry about earlier in your lives. The people of the future need you to keep trying because otherwise they will never exist. And just like without the people of the past, whatever we think of them, we wouldn't be here either. And that's a problem, since in a few minutes I need to present medals to the people sitting behind me, and they came a long way. So I want to end these remarks with a question instead of a statement. I think a lot of what our semester is going to be about and our year, and a lot about what the world is going through right now, involves asking how we should live in the world when we already know we're not going to get it right. Is there a right way to be wrong? Or maybe there are two sets of questions. One set is about how we'll view our history. Will we treat it objectively as a judgment-free description of who did what? Will we rate it simplistically from our high perch in the future? Or will we dare to approach it empathetically, getting down from our perch to imagine what it was like to be there and then to ask what we can learn from that historical imagination? The other set is about how we want to be seen by the people of our own future. 
Can we act in ways that are appropriate to the world we live in and also an anticipate the expectations of posterity? No matter what your interests and focus for this year, whether it's Hawaii or sustainability or macroeconomics or the visual arts, I hope you'll carry these inseparable questions around and just visit with them periodically. In what ways are you the product of those who came before you, no matter their achievements or flaws? And what kind of future are you going to help create? Your ability to ask such things of yourself and others is important, not just for your last year at Williams, but as you begin to think about the types of contributions you hope to make in the world and the kind of person you hope to be. Will you continue to learn and explore from a place of empathy? Will you help build a future that the students who come after you can embrace? My hope for you is that you do both and that you use your final year at Williams to take full advantage of all the school offers to prepare you for that journey. I will be with you every step of the way. Thank you.